the Buddha compared karma to seeds planted in a garden or in a field. Each of us has a huge field of seeds, some of which were planted just a moment ago, some of which are being planted right now, and a lot of which were planted a really long time ago, so long ago that we can't remember. Another lifetime, other lifetimes in the past. It's like those seeds of the chaparral that can lie dormant for many, many years. and then give rise to a plant only when the conditions are ripe. So when you look at karma coming up, and it's coming up all the time, your past karma. You see it right here as you're meditating. You make up your mind to do one thing, and then something else comes in totally unintended. Your intention to stay with the breath, that's a kind of karma in the present moment. But then these other habits that pull the mind back. Part of them come from your past karma, the part that just appears on its own. And then you've got the question, are you going to stay with the breath or are you going to go to the new topic? And that becomes your present karma, whatever you decide. So we're making karma all the time. We've been making it many, many times. So we have to learn how to manage our karma field, because it's from the plants that grow in our karma field that we create our food. So on the one hand, you want to look at the ingredients, and over which you have some control, but not all that much control. But then look more at your skill as a cook. You know, the really skilled cooks are the ones that can take almost any ingredient and make good food out of it. This is what we're learning as we're meditating, to be good cooks, how to pay attention to things that we want to pay attention to, and look at them from the right, from the right angle what the Buddha calls appropriate attention. So when something comes up, we're not just complaining about the bad things that are coming up, but we figure, well, what can be done with this? How can this tr be turned into good food? John Mahabhu talks about this a lot, the tendency of people to complain. You look in the Buddha's description of the path, right complaining is not one of the factors. But right intention, right resolve, being resolved to whatever comes up, you're going to treat it skillfully. Right effort, the desire to get rid of anything unskillful that's going to come up in the mind, and to encourage skillful things. Those are your cooking methods. The prime example is what the Buddha calls the ways of the world. There's gain and loss, status, loss of status, praise, criticism, pleasure, and pain. We all like the gain and status and praise and pleasure, but we can't have them without the other side as well. And so you have to learn how to look at these things in a way that you don't get carried away by the positive things and you don't get upset by the negative things. John Lee talks about how Status can be bad for you. You tend to forget yourself. Whereas loss of status can be good. You find out who your true friends are when people criticize you. If the, <coughs> if the criticism is true, then you've learned something that you may not have known otherwise. And if it turns out to be false, then you've learned something about the person who made the criticism. or developing a skill. And the same principle applies not only outside, but also inside, as you're sitting or meditating. You could sit here in a way that makes you miserable for the hour, and I've known people who've done that. Or you can find a way to create a sense of bliss, even though there may be pains in the body. You look at the different sensations in your body right now, you've got quite a range. It's not just everything is pain or everything is pleasure. There's usually a mixture, together with a lot of neutral things. So the question is, where do you focus the mind? How do you focus it? And then when a sense of pleasure comes from that focus, how do you make use of it? And John Lee recommends letting it spread around the body. And 
was just spread around the body, then maintaining that sense of full body awareness, full body pleasure. At that point, you've got three of the four foundations of mindfulness, or the establishings of mindfulness right there. You've got body filled with pleasure, filled with awareness. These are all things that we have already. You just learn how to make use of them and turn them into uh, your concentra <coughs> concentration food, a sense of rapture, the sense of well-being that comes when the mind can settle down like this. The Buddha talks about this in his analogy of the, being a meditator as being like being a good cook. He learns to read his master's desires. Sometimes the master will say out loud what he likes and what he doesn't like. But some, other times he doesn't. He just doesn't eat certain things, and he eats a lot of other things. And the good cook, good cook will notice that. So you have to look and see, what does your mind like right now? And then create a lot of that. You've got the potentials here, all this food coming in from your garden. The question is, what are you going to make of it? So you can make it a basis for concentration. You can make it a basis for insight when unpleasant things come. You can ask yourself, why am I suffering from this? All too often when there's a pain or something you dislike, the natural reaction is to suffer. But as the Buddha is pointing out in the Four Noble Truths, that's not necessary. There's the suffering and the three characteristics and just the way the things change. But that, he says, isn't the suffering that weighs the mind down. The suffering that weighs the mind down comes from craving and clinging. Craving and clinging that he defines in different ways. There's delight and there's passion, which take, can take all kinds of forms. So what form is it taking in your mind right now that a certain unpleasant event has made you suffer, or a certain physical pain is making you suffer? Learn how to separate these things out and see to what extent it's the pain is from coming from past karma and to what extent the, the suffering is coming from your present karma. Because without the clinging and the craving, there would be no suffering. That's how arahants live. They still have their seeds in their karmic fields that are sprouting every now and then. But they've learned how to fix them in ways that they don't have to suffer at all. So the suffering is optional. Pain is random. It can be explained through the principle of karma, but that doesn't really explain all that much. In other words, exactly which act in which lifetime gives rise to this particular pain right now. And the Buddha said, if you try to trace that out, you go crazy. The important principle is, what are you doing right now? What are you making of the raw materials you've got? That's the part of karma that he explains in a lot of detail. All of his meditation instructions are just that, cooking instructions. What to think about, how to think about it, where to focus, what to do with pain, what to do with pleasure. These are all things that we learn as we're sitting here practicing. So remember, the teaching on karma is very closely related to what you're doing right now as you're meditating, because meditation is a doing. Sometimes you hear it said that it's not a doing, it's just a being. But what you are is the result of what you do. It's the result of your intentions. So learn how to shape your intentions well, inform them well with appropriate attention. So that whatever comes up, your first question is, what good use can be made of this? And use your powers of observation and your powers of ingenuity to come up with something good to eat.